in the very lucky position that um, much better speakers earlier today have presented a lot of information that uh, normally would be included in this talk. So I've been a little bit uh, selective about what I'm going to talk about. So when we talk about the gut microbiota and the clinician, and I'm here speaking specifically about the clinician who deals with functional GI disorders, uh, they have a number of goals in mind. Will the microbiota, will probiotics help them in diagnosis, in defining prognosis, whether in terms of natural history or the response to therapy, and will these new agents help to treat their disorders? And in general, as I asked in this uh, opinion piece I wrote recently, uh, in general, we don't have all the answers. So why are we not there yet? Let's first look at diagnosis and prognosis. Now, there are some areas where we have a lot of information. Well, we know about clostridium difficile infection and antibiotic-associated diarrhea. We know what the risk factors are, we know what causes it, and we know how to treat it. But that's one of the few exceptions. There are some other hints out there. If we look at gastroesophageal reflux disease, there's this paper from several years ago, which has never been repeated, which showed that, indeed, if you looked at patients with reflux, and divided them into those with esophagitis, uh, those with Barrett's esophagus, and complained with normal controls, you actually did see a difference in the esophageal microbiome. Quite why this is happening is not clear and illustrates the challenges we face. Is this just a direct extension of the normal um, oral flora in terms of normals, or just reflux gastric juice in terms of reflux patients? Or, has reflux actually modified the microbiome by selecting against acid-sensitive bacteria? And most provocative of all, could the change in the microbiome be actually causing reflux and leading to inflammation? All of these questions are unresolved. Then there's this provocative study, which was mentioned this morning, uh, where, this is looking in terms of diagnosis, where this group in the European Consortium identified a um, particular microbiome signal among individuals with type 2 diabetes and then they applied this model to women with impaired glucose tolerance and were able to predict those who were going to develop full-blown uh, diabetes. Now this looked extremely exciting until somebody realized that this could in fact have been due to metformin use among the diabetics. So again an example of the confounders that can arise in these studies. This is a very fascinating study which looks at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and looked at patients in this kind of darker color here who went on to develop fibrosis and those who did not develop fibrosis in blue. And as you can see looking across here, I saw a variety of changes in the microbiome uh, which seemed to predict those who developed uh, fibrosis. And indeed they uh, did uh, an operator uh, curve showing that indeed this, the, these microbial signatures were highly predictive uh, of the development of fibrosis. And they suggested that the progression from NAFLD to uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is the critical transition in this disease, it was due to a gut microbiome-derived signature involving proteobacteria and E. coli and a relative depletion of firmicutase. Uh, more recently, another group showed that uh, looking at a response to treatment, that the abundance of acromantia could predict the response to calorie restriction in obesity. And these are the ones in dark who've got high levels of acromantia. The lighter ones have the low levels of acromantia. And you can see here uh, changes in insulin levels in the DISA index of obesity, and uh, looking at the glucose tolerance curve, and then looking at a variety of other metabolic parameters, including cholesterol and LDL. Now, there have been many studies, and some of them were mentioned this morning, and I'm sure many others will be mentioned in this meeting, which have associated the microbiome with a variety of disease states. But there are lots of problems with these studies. Many of them involve just a single point in time. They're not longitudinal. And therefore, have, find it very difficult to differentiate a signal which is trained from one which is a state. And of course, many times in the type 2 diabetes is a very good example, they did not correct for the possible confounding influence of therapy. They do not account for diet. Do we really know what is normal? We talk about dysbiosis, but I would argue that, in fact, we still haven't defined what's the normal microbiome. And then there are additional issues related to sampling. Now, we heard some beautiful talks this morning about diet and the microbiome. 
This is a study from here in Cork, looking at diet in the elderly, and showing a profound relationship between diet and the microbiome, no matter how you looked at it, by different measures of diversity. So the poorer the quality of your diet, the less diverse your microbiome. And this was another study done here looking at three groups of athletes, elite athletes, low BMI controls and high BMI controls, showing a marked difference in microbial diversity among the athletes who had a much more diverse microbiome. And when they looked at what was driving this, this is looking at the, you can see here in principle component analysis that their microbiome was quite different. And what this was related to was their protein intake. These elite athletes, like many elite athletes, consume very high levels of protein, and this indeed is what was driving the difference in their microbiome. Now, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, treatment, and I will not repeat the wonderful talk that um, Alex Ford gave this morning, looking at all the meta-analysis and the clinical trials of probiotics, or rather I'll make some specific points. Now, it is clear that there are many ways that we can modulate the microbiome. Um, and don't forget, as I've just mentioned, diet is a major modulator of the microbiome. There's a lot of interest now in a whole variety of diets in functional gastrointestinal disorders. Antibiotics, prebiotics, probiotics, synbiotics, fecal microbial transplantation, and pharmabiotics are all some of the potential mechanisms whereby we can modulate the microbiome. Now, diets have been popular for a long time in the treatment of functional gastrointestinal disorders. Began with simple exclusion diets like lactose or fructose or sorbitol exclusion. Recently, there's been a big fad for gluten-free diets, and of course, the big uh, noise is all about uh, the low FODMAP diet. But don't forget that our patients try many other different diets, usually without even telling us, like the Mediterranean, the Paleo, and the list is endless. This is one of the few studies that looked at the gluten-free diet. This is from Yolanda Sanz uh, in Spain looked at the gluten-free diet and showed that reductions in bifidobacterium and lactobacilli increases enterobacteriaceae and suggested that this indeed might have some role to play in the immunomonetary effects uh, related to uh, um, inflammation in the gut. Now, the low FODMAP diet, as you know, has become highly popular in the management of patients with functional gastrointestinal disorders. In fact, it's the uh, favorite uh, treatment of the day. Uh, however, there are some suggestions that all may not be great in terms of what the low FODMAP diet does to uh, the microbiome. So you, you get a high, higher fecal uh, pH, uh, you get changes in bacterial diversity, a reduced total bacterial abundance in comparison to the typical Australian diet. Um, this is an interesting paper which suggested that you could actually predict responders to a low FODMAP diet based on their baseline microbiome, showing that responders to the low FODMAP diet were enriched in baseline in OTUs of greater sacrolytic capacity, which makes sense within the family of Bacteroidacea and etc. Whereas non responders were enriched in baseline in the genus Turibacter. This is a recent study which looked at, in particular, and I'm focusing here really on the microbiological aspects, uh, on randomizing patients to either a low FODMAP diet or a high FODMAP diet. And what you saw, as you'd expect, is that the IBS symptom score it decreased in the low FODMAP diet, either was unchanged or increased on the high FODMAP diet, and there was a direct correlation between the change in symptoms and the dietary FODMAP score. Now, when we looked at the microbiology, there were some significant changes seen. And you can see here that the uh, high FODMAP diet is in darkness, the bacterial richness was somewhat less, the Firmicutes richness was less, and the actinobacteria richness was also le less. And as you can see here, there are also some changes in some very specific uh, species. And this is looking at the metabolome, where they also saw changes. This is at a baseline, and here's after the dietary intervention you saw significant changes in the metabolome in the low FODMAP diet uh, compared to the high FODMAP diet. Very recently, um, the group from Imperial, or Kevin Whelan's group, I should say, had looked at the um, potential role of a probiotic added to a low FODMAP diet in perhaps abrogating some of these effects on the microbiome. 
So what they did here was they randomized their patients to four different groups, uh, one of whom had got um, a sham diet and placebo, one sham diet and probiotic, another low FODMAP diet and placebo, and the other low FODMAP diet and, and probiotic. And what they showed was that uh, with the, <coughs> the addition of the probiotic, they could actually see some changes in some specific species which were otherwise reduced by the uh, low FODMAP diet. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about antibiotics, but here I want to focus on a particular message and not talk about the overall uh, issue of antibiotics and IBS. In the US, and I know not in, uh, in all of Europe or, or elsewhere, rifaximin is widely used in the treatment of uh, non-constipation irritable bowel syndrome. And this is based particularly on this uh, pivotal study which was published a few years ago, which showed that uh, this actually were two studies which gave identical results and if we just look at the combined data, we saw a therapeutic gain of about 9 to 10 for, uh, percent for rifaximin for either adequate relief of IBS symptoms or adequate relief of bloating. This was presented to the FDA, who insisted that there be a follow-up study performed to show that this actually could be repeated, because obviously there was an issue about whether this was a short-term or long-term uh, response. This was done, and what you can see here is that there was initial two-week treatment, then a treatment for the observation period, then a further two-week treatment, and again a uh, treatment for the observation period. And what they showed basically was that retreatment with Rifaxman actually did work. But what you can also see here is that uh, with Rifaxman, as you can see here, you see something that was seen in some earlier smaller studies, namely that even though you only treat for, with Rifaxman for two weeks, you do see a, an effect which lasts actually for several weeks. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that Rifaxin is a great treatment for IBS, but I find the fact that it works at all and the fact that it seems to have this prolonged effect is actually quite interesting. Why does it work? I think this is the more interesting question. Originally, the idea was that this was treating bacterial overgrowth, but I think most people now feel that the role of bacterial overgrowth in IBS is probably small. And it's furthermore, in all these clinical trials that I've shown you, the prevalence of IBS was not even studied. And there's also some data to suggest that the effect of um, rifaximin is not dependent on an abnormal breath hydrogen test. So could it be an effect on the clonic microbiota? Or even, as some have shown in IBD models, could this be an anti-inflammatory effect? The answer is we don't know. Now, what happens actually with rifaximin in IBS in terms of the microbiome? Well, there's this study, which is one of very few studies, which have looked at the microbiome in IBS, and here you can see there is a difference at baseline and species richness between healthy controls in IBS, and this seems to be normalized by rifaximin. However, if you look at another index, there's actually no change. And if you look in detail at various bacterial um, OTUs, you can see that there are some changes. But overall, my message from this is that there aren't great changes in the uh, enteric microbiota with uh, rifaximin in IBS. And indeed, that is supported by data from hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, a few years ago, Jaj Bajaj and his group showed that in patients with hepatic encephalopathy who definitely benefit from rifaximin, there are not significant changes in bacterial uh, populations in the gastrointestinal tract, but you do see changes in bacterial metabolism. And they studied this in more detail in this study using a humanized um, model, of humanized with cirrhotic stools, uh, and also use germ-free animals, randomized with or without rifaximin. And what you see here were actually uh, some unusual changes. In other words, you actually saw changes in serum ammonia, which actually were independent of antibiotic treatment, but changes in enzyme content, which actually were dependent on antibiotic treatment. And what they found in, rather than seeing great changes in bacterial populations, which they didn't see, they saw significant changes in intestinal barrier function and inflammation. I'm not going to list these, but here you can see several markers of intestinal barrier integrity and also of the immune response, suggesting that the effect of rifaximin in this model was more anti-inflammatory or gut barrier mediated rather than mediated via an antibiotic effect. Now I want to say a few words about probiotics before I finish, but I'm here again I'm going to make general points. Yes, we have data to suggest that probiotics are affected in functional bowel disorders, but I think there are many out there which have no data, and I think we should be moving into an era where our probiotics are characterized at genome level, 
where we have definition of basic properties, as we've just heard about, and where we have clear identification of functions, again, as emphasized by the previous speaker. And this is where we should be. We should be defining our probiotics at, genome, at the level of genome so we can produce rep reproducible data. This is an elect electron micrograph. We should show that any probiotic that we propose to use in man actually does transit the GI tract, does survive transit to the GI tract, uh, if it's going to have efficacy at its uh, target organ, whether it's the small intestine or the large intestine. We should demonstrate in in vitro and in vivo studies that there are no pathogenicity islands, there's no transmissible drug resistance, there's acid and bile resistance, and of course that antibiotic sensitivity is defined. If it's important that it has antibacterial effects, these should be quantified. If, if, if we're interested in immune effects, these should also be studied. And this again is in response to the previous speaker. Uh, we should look at IgA production, the production of pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory cytokines, engagement in treating cells, uh, etc. And this is the organism that we've studied a lot over the last few years, just to illustrate at this point, where we've been able to show in a variety of studies that unlike pathogens, this bifidobacterium does not activate an inflammatory pathway, but rather engages with dendritic cells and actually activates a T-regulatory cell pathway leading to the downregulation of inflammation. And this has been shown in, in man, this is in human volunteers, showing an elevation in levels of IL-10, either in comparison to placebo or in comparison to baseline. And also, as shown here in, in a variety of inflammatory disorders, showing a reduction in CR, C, CRP levels, in psoriasis, in patients with IBS with chronic fatigue syndrome, and in ulcerative colitis. And as you can see here, when you look at the, at the what actually is turned on or turned off by the bifidobacterium in comparison to placebo, you see a reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines and in CRP. Now, this study was mentioned this morning, and I think this is a very exciting departure in terms of the issue of the microbiotic gut-brain axis. This is a very detailed study from the group of McMaster who studied patients with IBS and comorbid um, depression and looked at a variety of factors, including brain imaging. And what they showed basically was that even though there was no change in IBS symptoms, there was a significant reduction in, in, in anxiety, sorry, in anxiety among these patients uh, with comorbid anxiety, as, as you can see here and here. And this was associated with some metabolomic changes but no changes in the fecal microbiota. So in their particular study, they've demonstrated effects on the CNS and depression. And to date, this is one of the few demonstrations of microbiome brain gut axis activity in a clinical context, but there was no impact on IBS. And the effect was not related to changes in the microbiome or the immune response. Now, before I finish, I want to emphasize a few points about these clinical studies with probiotics. Strain selection often seems haphazard. For the most part, we have not defined optimal dose for probiotics. We seem to choose doses at random. We should study what are the optimal formulations, and we should pay a lot more attention to study design in terms of patient population, ensuring the study is adequately powered, is of adequate duration, that there's an appropriate comparator. If there is an effective agent in the disorder, that should be the comparator. And we should use validated outcome measures. Above all, we should not be extrapolating results from one strain to another or from one species to another. Now, what is the future? Well, we may be looking at dead organisms, genetically modified organisms, or even bacterial products. And I'll just give you one or two examples. Genetically modified organisms, which will probably find it difficult to come to market for a variety of reasons, partly political, can deliver therapeutic agents. And this has been shown with IL-10 and IBD. They can deliver vaccines and they can even modify metabolic processes, at least in animal models, it's been shown that they can increase conjugate linoleic acid content of the liver, and that's been associated with an anti-inflammatory phenotype. This is another bacterial product, a bacteriocin. These have been studied extensively here in Cork. This example, this is a bacteriocin, uh, which is highly effective against Listeria monocytogenes. Others have been elaborated against C. difficile. And this is recent work, again, from the group here, uh, where they've actually took this bifida bacterium, with, which has got this elaborate extrapalosaccharide, exopalosaccharide coat, they've actually purified it, characterized it molecularly, and then showed that when you compare the, the, the uh, wild organism with the 
with an organism which this court has been knocked out by, you actually lose, not only lose this anti-inflammatory effect, you actually transform it into a pro-inflammatory organism as shown here by elevated levels of TNF-alpha and shown here with IL-17. And in, in terms of clinical, uh, this organism which had an effect in colitis no longer has this protects against colitis in, in an animal model. So, my summary is that I do believe that the gut mic microbiota represents a legitimate target for therapeutic modulation, perhaps in some patients with irritable bowel syndrome. Prophylaxis of uh, post-infectious IBS would be an obvious target uh, for treatment or for prevention in IBS, but this has never been evaluated. I've mentioned bacterial overgrowth. Its role in IBS remains controversial, but I would say that rifaximin does work quite independent of any effect of bacterial overgrowth, but we don't know why. Probiotics continue to show promise in IBS, but we still have a lot of work to do to compare which are the optimal species, which are the optimal indications, which are the optimal patient populations. Thank you very much. Thank you.